Uh, good afternoon. T today is the 1st of April in 2015. I'm Daryl Peterson, a volunteer at the Palm Springs Air Museum here in Palm Springs, California. As part of the, vis the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., we conduct interviews of veterans and civilians who participated in our country's military conflicts, especially World War II. Today I'm here at the museum with uh, uh, Mr. Leo Midler, who is a Holocaust survivor, as well as a, a, a veteran of the U.S. Army. Uh, his wife is also here, uh, Florence, and uh, we're glad to have you both here and uh, look forward to hearing your experiences. So. Thank you. Thank you. Start off by having you give your full name and spelling it and telling us where and when you were born. My name is Leo Mittler, M-I-T-T-L-E-R, and I was born in Poland in a small town named Andrychow, A-N-D-R-Y-C-H-O-W. It's about 12 miles away from Auschwitz, between Krakow and Bielsko. The, those main cities and uh, during the war I was taken as a prisoner, a holocaust survivor, you know, concentration camp as mm -hmm. a slave labor and I had to work over there and so on. Can we uh, first tell us a little bit about your family and uh, what was happening, I guess, before uh, you were uh, taken? And well, my, my father was a big patriot, of Polish patriot, and uh, he, we, uh, what I understand, we had a chance to immigrate to Australia, and uh, my father didn't want to. He says, ah, this is my country, and uh, he stayed there during the Germany, what's, what's going on, the Holocaust and everything else. So this was in like the mid thirties or something. Right, beginning thirties, right. Okay. And, uh, what and, yeah. and what occupation uh, was he? Uh, my no, my father had a factory. He was producing shoe leather at Tannery we had. Oh. And uh, first he started by hand, there were the, like like people start business in garage, and then he made money and everything and was good. So he bought a piece of land and he built a factory and in 1935, as a matter of fact, the factory was built and was christened by a rabbi and so on and the business was flourishing and we were pretty well to do family. We, we had uh, uh, made and uh, I, as a matter of fact, had a nanny when I was a kid and so on and uh, we lived very modestly. My mother used to go to uh, you know, for result for summertime, and uh, we lived very comfortable till the war broke out. And when the broke, when the war broke out in 1939, like hell broke loose. Mm -hmm. We got separated. My father, one of, because we were running away from the Germans, so my father went out that part of Poland which was occupied by the Russian, and my mother and my grandmother and myself, we were separated from them and uh, we were caught by the Germans and we had to come back home to our... So you, uh, you have one brother or one sister? I had two brothers. Two brothers? And myself. And they're older, younger? They're older. They're my uh, one, the oldest one, six years older than I was. He just passed away about five years ago. I brought him here from uh, from Israel, and uh, the other one, when the Germans occupied the part of Russia, what they were, they the Jews have to had to dig their own grave and they shot him. Mm. 
my father somehow managed to get a hold of a high-ranking German officer and he told him what kind of trade he has. So they told him, you get two more men and a woman and we're going to use you. So he was looking for my brother, but he couldn't find him because there were a lot of and young fellows go with young fellows together, so he couldn't find him, and he had they didn't give him time to look hard for him, mm. so he couldn't find him, and uh, he was working for the army. What he was one because the army needed a lot of cows to kill for meat and so on, so they were giving him the hides. And he was producing the leather for the shoes, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and he had a paper, this Jew is to not harm him from the German army. But when the Russians start coming back, the Germans took off, left him. So the Ukraine, some Ukrainians who hated Jews came in and they took them all and shot him. And how do I know? Because there was one Paul from my town he used to come to my father every month. He gave him bread and he gave him a lot of food because he had a lot of food from the army. And, uh, and that was in January 1944. He went there and the house was empty, so he inquired by the neighbors. So they told him that Ukrainians came in and they killed him. Hmm. So Back up a little bit here and tell us about the life before the occupation. Uh, you know, well, what, the what kind of school did you go to? I went, uh, well, I went to the third grade public school because I was only nine, ten, no, I was already at that time 12 years old. And uh, we had a normal life. I belonged to Boy Scouts and we had activities. Uh, sports and clubs and that. And was, was, the, was that segregated at that time? Or was no, it, there was no segregation. Everybody was but, happy uh, together. Well, huh? Usually Jewish people stick together, you know, so they were together, uh, belong to the community and then they had a, a club, Jewish clubs over there and so on. And I belonged to Boy Scout and uh, in 1939, as we were in a mountain retreat, for a couple of weeks, but we had to make it short because the war started very, was rambling already, that's gonna be. So we came home and sure enough, on September 1st in 39, the war broke out. My father had a truck and he used to go once a month to a few slaughterhouses and buy the hides and bring them and we had like 75, 80, I don't know, remember exactly employees working and the equipment. He just bought brand new equipment when he f finished the building. And uh, the business was very nice. Man. As a matter of fact, we were uh, in Polish. There were some other tanneries. So we were the second best producer of the leather. And we also supplied to Bata factory hides Bata shoes, I don't know if you heard about. Um, it's, a, it's a famous European, and in Canada, as a matter of fact, they have a factory. Uh, Bata, it's called in Czechoslovakia. And we were selling to them uh, hides, you know, for manufacture for the thing. Did you work in the factory? No, even? I was too young. <laughs> too was, young, yeah. Yeah, but the Sundays I like to. I mean, Sundays I used to go there, and uh, we had a special room, what they with a big table like this, and uh, my mother, my father sometimes go and they because they were selling the height, the size of the height, and there was a special gadget, what is so I sometimes go there. And I measured the height and marked down what size it was. <laughs> I, I enjoyed those things too. Uh, yeah. And I used to hang around a lot in the factory because the floors were nice marble and they had a wagon, you know, and it was very easy glide. So we, as a kids, I used to get friends. On the weekend, we used to go over there and play around. Go forever. <laughs> that, yeah. that sounds like fun. Yeah. Right, there was and a lot the, of fun. And the better. <coughs> Better days, huh? Yeah. 
So no, no. What? It's, it's, it's on the memories. That's what? It. <coughs> what was the conversation like with when on September 1st with the Jewish people? That, did they <coughs> expect what they, was coming? They, or? they were expecting because there was rambling, a lot of rambling and everything. But my father didn't think that, that something like this would happen, that they would go occupy the land and, um, and start killing people and so on. You know. The life was very normal, like uh, over here family lives. And, uh, they used to go skiing because we live in the, surrounded by mountains. So my father used to go skiing, and my brothers. I was too young to do those things. Yeah. And then the war broke out, so everything changed. We were depressed and this, deprived of everything. And then <clears throat> when the, the Germans came to the house, whatever they liked, they liked the furniture. They just called and they took the furniture out. They took blankets out. And uh, in 1940, 41, they start taking young people from the street and send them to labor camps. That time they used to call them Jewish camps, not the concentration camps yet. And then, uh, they had food and they did, they didn't pay him much and every so often they let him come for a week back home and then this and then in 1941 they decided to put all the Jews like in a ghetto that they could have better control so they moved the, they moved some Gentile families out from certain section and they put us over there and those people could have the, our homes. So that was in each city. There was kind of a cordoned like off area, and every every city had a little. Yes, every you know. every city who was little size that could be, and if there, if there were any Jews in there. Uh, what do you call it, on the farm or so, they t took him out from the farm, they put him in the city to be in the ghetto too, you know, they moved, they moved them out from over there, that issue. And uh, <clears throat> so then they came in one day very early in the morning and we had to march across the town to a certain section with, that was about 300, 200, I don't remember exactly, but as we were crossing the bridge and making a right turn, people got panicky because there was a slaughterhouse there. And they thought we were gonna get slaughtered like animals over there. So there was a little commotion. So they stopped and uh, <clears throat> said, what's going on? So the, our eldest, we had this representative who was in charge of us, he says, why do you have to march us across the town? You could have killed us over there. Why, why you have to go to the slaughterhouse to kill us? Also, he said, so the one officer, the German says, oh, no, 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 we're not going to kill you. We, know, we just want to check some. So sure enough, we stayed there overnight. It was uh, summertime, I think June or July. So we stayed overnight in a field where the animals usually stay. And the next day morning came a fancy German car with two, two ranking high officers and uh, we had to assemble by family and come in front of him and he didn't say nothing, he just took, like, he had a baton and he made three groups. So so happened that my mother went up in one group, my grandmother another one and I in third one. And <clears throat> Myself, they took with the other people what I wind up, they marched us to the railroad station and they put us on train and they sent us to another Jew, uh, city, which is big Jewish population. There was a Jewish school there, big building and everything. And in that building, they had hundreds and hundreds of young people 
And from over there, they were sending them to different places to work, to Germany. My mother, they left alone that she should go back to the ghetto. And my grandmother, with some other old ladies, with children, they put him on a truck and they took him to Auschwitz to be killed right away. Hmm. Now, I was there about five, six days in that uh, school over there. And one day they brought some young girls from some different town, Jewish girls, and they didn't want that we should mingle with them, we should talk to them. So we stayed on a field for quite a few hours and it was sun and what happened, I passed out. So they took me to a room and uh, there was a Jewish fellow doctor who knew my uncle very well and uh, he says, this kid is not ready yet to go and they discharged me. So when they discharged me, they sent me back home. Day later, there was a girl who another fellow tried to fix up that she could get out something like me. They discharged her, but they sent her direct to Auschwitz mm. to be killed. So I, I don't know, uh, even now, you know, I'm 88 years old, I feel like I have something up above me what's what watching me that I'm still alive. Yeah. You know? So you were like 14 at that, at that time? At that time I was, I was 14, yes. Yeah. So I came home, my mother was very happy. She was working in that kitchen over there. She was so happy and uh, she was cooking for us, uh, making uh, coffee and a sandwich for breakfast and then they were cooking for supper when we came in. We, we had a meal like stew. Most of the time was stew or something like that. Anyway, I came home. She was so happy and everything, and I stayed there. And <clears throat> it took about a few more months, maybe half a year. I don't remember exactly. She And she used to get up to, to the kitchen very early to, to prepare because we had to leave by 7 o'clock. So she had to get up, I don't know, 4 o'clock or whatever. Mm -hmm to prepare this thing. And she wakes me up, she says, wake up, they came back, they're gonna take you. So she made me a backpack and everything. And the uh, same thing happened. We had to get out outside and the guys came in. They didn't take me, they took my mother. They took my mother and some other ladies and children and they put her on the truck and it's direct to, the, to Auschwitz, they took it. And uh, we were still there for a few months. And uh, after a few months, they decided they're gonna close the camp, the ghetto. So first they took all the men and they sent me to a steel mill factory. It was still in Poland. Uh, the name was Królewska Huta. And we were working there for a few weeks. And uh, then the Germans decided to move us, to, so they send us to Czechoslovakia, to coal mine, to Karvin, a coal mine. And we, that time was already a, a camp, about 1,500 people there. And we worked in the coal mine over there. We weren't that long, about six months, they decided they're gonna move us again. So they moved us to another camp. And I stayed there, I think a week or two. And from this camp, there was about 10,000 people that then there was a distribution camp, Gross Rosen was the name. And from that camp, they sent me to a camp named Markstedt. Markstedt was a camp by Breslau, by Wroclaw. And there, there were Krupfer machine, you know, the Krupp. Uh, they were making a war production, mm -hmm. guns and uh, yeah. work, military equipment. And they, I went over there, there was a 5,000 of us over there in that game. And we used to work like slaves over there. And they put me first, they put me to work, I lay, they showed me how to lay bricks. And I was laying bricks. At that time I was already 15, 15 and a half years old. I was laying the bricks because they were building more buildings, you know, and uh, they needed the, then they needed the people 
what they looked healthier, and I was always chubby. So they picked me up from it, and they put me into a job, which I had to dig ditches, you know, for lining pipes to the Russian front, because the the gas or fuel or whatever they knew. So I was digging the ditches, and there was winter time. It was very cold. We didn't have too much clothes, and I had frostbites. My fingers were frozen, and my shoulder. And that frostbite, the body fluid was just oozing out, and they were, we didn't get no medication happening. So the shirt always absorbed the liquid. And overnight, when it dried out, it was like a sandpaper board, you know. So the next day, when I started digging again, I right away opened the wound. So it was pretty bad. And I says, I don't know what to do. You know, I was all alone, I, I a kid. I says, I, I'm going to go on a sick call. So I went to the, the, the and every time the sick call, there was maybe 100, 200 people winding up, you know, they, but they, they couldn't do nothing. So when I came to the doctor over there, he says, I, I don't have nothing for you to do. So he gave me a piece of rag, you know, a clean one. He says, you tear it in pieces and put it there, and when it's wet, you throw it away. So I was doing it for a few days. And one day I'm looking, I see white. I saw my bones sticking out. Mm -hmm. So I went back again and I showed it to him. He says, he, he says, he did like this. He says, let me see. So he called the supervisor and he says, look, we're going to lose the kid. Why don't you get him a better job, easier job? So they took me off the job. They kept me in the camp and I was like picking up garbage, papers and so in the camp. But that, that was only about two, three weeks because that they decided they're going to close the camp. So now, were these all young people, or were this anyway any from able-bodied to able-bodied walking? They mm -hmm. were old people too, not barely walking, but the, anybody who was walking. If if they saw that person, to, you know, they took him right away. They disposed of them. You mm -hmm. know, there was no crematorium there, but they put them in hold, and then as a group, they sent them out to. Auschwitz, you know, so, okay. so but they did didn't have to even uh, do that because a lot of people were dying from hunger, you know, from uh, they were. Yeah, from, I was going to ask you whether they were providing you with any kind of uh, nutrition or well, uh, food, and well, uh, it was like this: in the morning we got black water. There was a coffee, <laughs> a hot coffee. The coffee was. The Germans made the coffee from that ground and everything. And then they took the grounds, they dumped it in the water and boiled it again, and that's what was our coffee, you know. Yeah. I, I never drank it because it was so bitter and everything. Yeah. At night when we came, we got our portion. We had a piece of bread. And that and from the beginning. So how was the... Uh supplies. Did the farms continue to be operated by the people that owned them before the occupation? or they No, no. The farm they in just Poland, disintegrated? In Poland, or? No, in Poland what happened, they took the Poles out and they brought from Bessarabia uh, 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 some sex which was very uh, uh, friendly with Germany. No. They gave them those farm, you know, so like uh, they were best Arabian, uh, thing like gypsies, but they put them there and they ran this thing and they kicked out the poles, the farms and everything else, you know. No. So there you was... Know, but uh, there was not, uh, we were already, uh, we're talking in Germany, we were already in Germany. So meat we never got except if an animal died from sickness or so, so they gave us the meat, so they chopped it up and put in the water and boiled with uh, like a soup with some potatoes and that's what. Usually we had a soup 
was watermelon soup. That was our, <laughs> yeah, the watermelon, weird. that was the certain thing. So we were getting a Russian of, a piece of bread, a little tiny, at that time, from beginning, piece of, a little square piece of butter, and uh, we, we were from beginning even getting cigarettes, like two cigarettes, so what I was doing, I was trading the cigarette for a piece of bread, you know. Because I didn't smoke and uh, I knew the bread I need more important than that. And then I used to even thread and trade the thing for anything that I could get to eat. Yeah. Anyway, to continue this thing, they decided to close this camp, so they, that was in February, and never forget, we had to undress in one barrack and ran across the field to another barrack, which there were three Nazis sitting there, and they were watching your movement, how you look, and what's what, and they were putting you there. So I was assigned to go with some other people to another camp named Bunslau. Bunslau was about maybe 50 miles away from this camp. They put us in a railroad car, and we were, it took us three days without food or anything in that railroad car. Just give us, they gave us a bucket of water and uh, we made a hole in the floor that that's how we could discharge ourselves and so on. And then um, three days later we got to that camp. In this camp, I was assigned, they were making, there was a lumber factory. They were making prefabricated barracks, walls, and roofs, and so on. And I was assigned to carry with four other, three other fellows, at one wall to the to the flat car on the railroad, because they were shipping them to the Russian front for the soldiers that they should have protection. And we were doing this for quite a few days. And one day, our supervisor, the capo you know, he wanted to show the Germans that we could carry more, so he put just a minute, so he put another wall on top that we could, was so heavy we couldn't, so they stopped beating us. And they beat us. And you know, even when you get beaten, you don't know your strength. We picked it up, we carry a few feet, and there was a Hungarian Jew a pharmacist he never worked in his life heavy. And a little guy, think his guts went into the sack mm -hmm. and he died right on the spot. Mm -hmm. And me, I didn't, uh, I was that time already 16 years old. I was so perspired, I didn't pay attention and everything. And that time was drizzling and I caught pneumonia. But it took about a week Till I knew that well, I, I, I was dying actually. I couldn't talk. I was weak and I, I, I just, I barely walked. And the last day I says that I got to do something. So every time, you know, when you come back from war, you run to the sick hall over there if you have some problem. So I wonder, but oh, there is a lot of other people. There was 1,500 people in that camp, mm. and there is always about 50, maybe 100 lining up. And I couldn't stay at night, so I lay down against the building on the floor, and I lay. I figured when the last guy comes in, I'm going to go in there. So sure enough, when the last guy f finished, I got up. So the guy who was helping the doctor, he says, get the hell out of here, we finish. And I started making noises. I couldn't, my, I didn't talk normal, just sound, making some kind of noise. So the doctor heard some kind of noise. He came out, what's going on? And he sees something not normal with me. So he took me in. He says to me, you're very sick. How come you wait the last minute to come? I, I couldn't talk, I would sign, you know, I talked this. He says, I can't do nothing for you. But he called the supervisor, just like before, different camp. He says, look, this kid we're gonna lose, I can't do nothing, he's sick. 
but we can save him. So he says, take him to work, put him in a hole and bury him that they shouldn't see him, that he's not working. And when he comes back, I'm going to have a room. Because each camps like this, there was only limited people what he can have on a sick call. So, and over that, he could have on a tank people sick, you know. So he kept it. So he apparently discharged somebody else when I came back from that. I went direct there, I didn't eat and everything. So the next day they took a chair, they like you, and they tie me up to the chair. He took a needle about so big and a little thinner than that, and through my rib cage, he pierced to the, my lung. There was so much pressure, so well, the, the whole wall was plotted with yellow fluid. Mm. The whole wall, and as soon as that happened, I was like no born person. I says, I can talk, I can breathe. I couldn't breathe before. I, uh, the way I was breathing, <coughs> that's how I was breathing. So anyway, then, so he says, uh, and beside this, I had a very, very high temperature, very high temperature from the. So <coughs> he says, you'll be all right, be all right, quiet. So he kept me there on the two days and I wasn't perfect in this, but he says, look, we need desperately to, you know, you're going to be okay, you go out. And they let me, they sent me out back to work. And he told the same guy who took me, in, I think, he says, don't give him the same work. So they gave me driving nails in the board, you know, so I was at least doing that. And then, a few months later, I heard that they're gonna send a group of people to different camp. So I said to myself, it can be worse. It can be worse. Maybe it's gonna be better. And sure enough, uh, I got, I, they took me. There was, um, I don't know how many people. They put us on trucks and they took us to the other camp. My uncle was there. Mm. And my uncle was a couple. And he had a deal with the kitchen guy because he knew him and so on, that he was getting double ration of food. So when I came in, you know, the everybody comes in and asks, what's your name, what's what? So when I said, Mittler, so he says, that your father here? I says, no, my father, no, but maybe my uncle, sure enough, my uncle was there. So they took me to him. He, <clears throat> my uncle took a sandwich right from under behind his pillow. He gave it to me. I devoured like an animal, mm -hmm. and uh, that's uh, this. So the, he made a deal that I was getting double ration of food, and that's how I survived. Mm -hmm. My uncle died this and then three days after the liberation. Oh, yeah. that was a couple of years later. Then. Well, the only one year, not even one year later, half a year later. Oh, okay. Because. Uh, I, I was liberated on February 10, 1945, by the Russian troops, and he was liberated in uh, April in Czechoslovakia by the Russian, but he died because of typhus, mm. three days after liberation. So what, what happened to your father? You may have said it, but I... My father, they killed him. They, yeah. The Ukrainians, they killed my father and the two other men and a woman, they shot him because they choose. Okay. So, well, that was a terrible time of history. Yeah, yeah very dark. Now I, I came to home, everything was confiscated, the Poles took it. I couldn't get nothing. And then all of a sudden, you know, we had the factory and what happened during the war, a German from Bremen who was manufacturing for war production, he was banned. So they gave him a choice to come, to move to this factory. So he did, and he he got a machine, a tool dime machinery. And that, there was 300 people on three shifts working 24 hours a day mm. over there during the war. And beautiful machinery. So when the Russians came in, they took everything out. And I, like a kid, I was that time 17 years old, I didn't know what's communism or anything. And I wanted to stop him, 
to the, so they were left and they kicked me out from the factory. So I cry, I was crying and ran, and ran to the mayor of town, tell him. So he says, you can't do those things, this is different world. But I'll take a look at what's going on. So the, the liberating force was the Russians? Russians, the, okay. yeah. yeah. So he went there, he tried to talk to this. So he says, I'm going to put a request to send him to Siberia to send me. So, so, I, so when he told me that, I says, why? What did I do? Because you have a bourgeois ideas. <laughs> so I had to run away from my town. So I moved to Krakow. And meanwhile, the, my uh, Poles knew where I was. And my uncle sent a, a, a telegram to my mother, you know, and I replied to it that I am only alive. And he, he sent papers to come to this country. So I went to Warsaw, that was in 1945, yet, I think in June, July. I went to Warsaw, American consulate, so he says, yeah, the papers don't mean nothing. We only take an American citizen. You are eventually going to get there, but uh, not right now. So and then, then there was a friend of my uncle who was living in the town where my uncle used to live. And I went there because he, my uncle says, he's going to give me money and so on, help me out. So he says, why don't you go to the American zone? The American zone, you're going to be able to go in no time. So I smuggled myself through the borders and everything to Germany. And I went over there, reported, showed them the papers. So I was the third person what had affidavit to come to America. But it still took two years almost. So April 22nd, 1947, I came to this country. Hmm. So what, what did you do in the, in the meantime? And how, how did you get from well, one place to the I other? Was, you, I was a displaced person. Hitchhike? <laughs> no, there was a camp. We had, they had camps in Germany. Displaced person, UNRWA, you know UNRWA? Homeland. UNRWA, UNRWA, United Restitution. So it was they like were, they were helping they refugees. Were American, yeah, they were helping the refugees. Right. Okay. And I, I was in one camp and I was a, like a policeman in that camp, you know, making the thing. And that's how I stayed there for a couple of years. Till they, they called me in and then they, I came to this country. And I came in 47. I tried to get a job. I had a hell of a job to get a job because I didn't talk English. But finally I got a job. This, I stood the back of dealer, you know, as an auto mechanic helper. And the minimum wage was 75 cents an hour. That time I, he paid me 50 cents. <laughs> as long as I had enough for food, so uh, that's what it was. So I, I was making, uh, get me this 50 cents an hour, and uh, I stayed there uh, a year. And uh, after the year, I uh, say, how about the race? So the fellow who was a shop foreman, he was an old Austrian, the best, excuse my expression. He hated the Jews, but he worked for the Jews because the dealership was a Jewish owner. You know? <laughs> so I said to the boss, you know who you got here? He said, he's my breadwinner. He's the man. <laughs> he was a good mechanic. So, the, And he taught me, but he was a real tough guy. He says, you want something, you come to me, you don't come to him, I am the boss here. So, anyway, I had a run with him. I almost had a fight because the near big trial was going on. And one day when we were taking break, he says, that son of a gun, Roosevelt, they should have hanged him before they hanged those Nazis over there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I said, why? So he says, you shut up. You know, so I said, you're going to hit me? I was that time 20 years old. I said, you're going to hit me? Go ahead. I would have killed him on the spot. 
not that I'm a hero, but you know, just from a hatred what I had. Anyway, and I, I changed the job because I went uh, for a week vacation and I went to a Ford agent dealership and I introduced myself and I, at that time I already, I spoke a little bit English and I used to go to night school, you know, to mm -hmm. learn more basic English. So I introduced myself. He hired me immediately, dollar twenty-five an hour. So I said to him, "I can't leave. I have to. I want to be a nice guy. Tell him to this." So I went over there. I told him that I'm leaving. So he says, "Well, okay, go ahead." Hmm. So he, he, uh, that's okay. So I left. I went over there. I worked there for another year, and the Korean War broke out. And June or July, I got the greeting, I want you. So I had to go to for the board and everything. And in July, I was in uh, Fort Dix taking basic training. When, when did you get your citizenship then? After I got discharged from the service. Oh, so you were not I, a citizen no, even I was not, no. it, but there, you were drafted. There was a lot of people that were Puerto Ricans and Spanish and a lot of Holocaust survivors, they none, none of them was Jewish, Jewish you know, the citizens, no. Hmm. Uh, I got That's my citizen a... after five years. Okay, I didn't, uh, I didn't know so, they were... Oh yeah. Uh, yeah uh, how would they, know, how would the they even thing. find out about you that uh, you're... Well, you had to register, you know. Okay. You had to register as you come in. You had to register, especially there was a draft age at that time, and uh, the age was there. Uh, you had to you okay. know, so register. You, you had to register oh, yes. with the selective oh, yes. service no, back then. Because I had the social security and everything. Oh, you know, okay. everything was legal. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So now you're in the army. No, I was in the army. <laughs> I served my two years, and I never resented because I learned how to live with people. I, 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 my youth was an, an slave, so and you live for yourself. Everybody is on his own, like it's a doggy's dog, you know. Yeah. And uh, I learned how to live with people, and uh, and the main thing I learned good English, and uh, I got down. Uh, after two years. So where, where did they send you for training and... Uh... Well, I went to basic training in Fort Dix, New Jersey, and then we moved to Camp uh, Fort Meade, Maryland. That's, uh, we, we were in a regiment which was protecting Washington capital and so on. Okay. Uh, it's an armored regiment. And then uh, well, they sent me to Fort Knox, Kentucky for a 10-year course because they got brand new tanks, different models. So I went for a 10-week course over there, and I had papers to go to Korea. But when I reported, well, first I went home for uh, 10 days, and then when I report, he says, the sergeant says, soldier, you not go no place. I said, oh, welcome. We need you here. They sent me to North Carolina, they had maneuvers over there in North Carolina. They didn't have no tank mechanics. Uh -huh. So I went to, to North Carolina for, I think we were there for about three months. And then after this, they sent me to a Camp Breckenridge, Kentucky. That's the 101st Airborne, but the 101st Airborne wasn't there. There was a boot camp for new recruits coming in, and I was a cadre over there for a short time. And then I got again papers to go to Korea. I kept my mouth shut. I know I wouldn't go anymore because I was due for discharge. In a few <laughs> okay. But I kept my mouth shut because I wanted want to go home. And you know, so I went home. And then when I report back, I said, "Search." By the time I get there, you're gonna to have to send me back. He says, what do you mean? I says, I'm due to discharge in July or August. So he looks, Jesus Christ, how did we miss that? <laughs> so, so that was my- Pays to speak up, huh? <laughs> Well, I, uh, look, nobody wants to go to fight, 
you know. It's it's a horrible thing, a okay. war. That's for sure. So they 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 let you go. Well, you know, he he he, he sent me back to my old outfit, what I originally was, and uh, that was Camp Pickett, Virginia. And I spent three months over there in Camp Pickett, and I so I took advantage. I took a GDD test, you know, the high school mm -hmm. thing, and I passed it. Not with flying colors, but I. Passed, I think, in seventy or sixty-nine, something like that. You know, and uh, I was in the motor pool over there, and, with, and, uh, and that's how. I, mm -hmm. so. And the one thing was very touchy when I was drafted, which I never expected. That place, the Ford dealer where I worked, they made a collection. I never, I mean, they made a party for me too, because I, I cry, I even now when they cry, I, you know, it was so touchy, you know, I, I didn't expect that, and I never forget, they, they raised eighty-seven dollars. <laughs> oh my God, yeah. they were so, and the, the boss, the boss was, <clears throat> he was a very wealthy uh, philanthropist uh, guy. He had so much money, he had fingers in a lot of things, and people were running for him, but they wrapped him blind. Oh. So, but anyway, he came to that thing, and he says, when you come back, you got the job here, you don't have to worry, you come back. When I came back, the, they went, they closed up the place. Oh. <laughs> because the, the people, the employees were stealing them blind over there. Yeah. Yes. There was a guy over there working, he had, he had his own parts place in the basement over there. He was stealing, because I was working in the new car department, you know, installing the radios and the, he was taking radios and stealing, and then selling them on the side. Oh, yeah. That's low, very yeah. low, you know. And, and everybody else, they were stealing the, the you know, hmm. terrible. So now you're out of work, huh? Now I am. I'm looking for a job. <laughs> My wife needs money. <laughs> oh well, you you have to tell us how you met your wife. You want to? Yeah, but how about a little break for him? Okay. All right. We'll uh, take a break. We here. made. Them. I when I I worked when I came back. I worked for another agency, Ford agency, because you know the mechanics uh, know each other and so. So they told me, come on over, you get this job. So I got this in Manhattan, and we were 23 mechanics in that shop. We were very friendly. Pretty and big shop. Yes. <laughs> there was a House of Hogan. There's no one there, I'm sure. House of Hogan. Anyway, so there was one Italian fellow younger than me, and he says, you know, we like, we comparable, why don't we go on business? So I said to him, fine, but I ain't got no money. <laughs> so he says, can you scrape $1,500? I says, I don't know, I have to ask my friends. My uncle, I wouldn't even ask. So I talked to a friend of mine, and he, he was making good money. <clears throat> he says, I'll loan it to you. And he got it from his father, $1,500, $3,000, and that time, in 1956, they were go opening up gas stations every corner. Yeah. Sometimes the golf station was up four corners. <laughs> every corner was a golf station. And we got a golf station in Long Island. And he was with me for about half a year. And then I said, you guys are too good to be together. We have another golf station. So they took my partner and they sent him to school to Connecticut. And they gave him another golf station at uh, Long Island. Uh, I don't remember the place anyway. And he had the gas station there. And uh, and I had mine. And then I brought my brother in, and he was mechanic too. So after a while, he he was working for Volkswagen companies and so on. And he, he was a go-getter, go-getter. So I took him in as a partner. 
Did he so, have similar experience with the camps no, in he, Europe? He, he survived in the South, uh, in the Asia through the Russian. Russians sent him to to a commune. He was crippled on one foot, you know, he had oh. one foot shoulders, so they wouldn't put him in the army, but uh, he, and he survived. So he came home in 1956, but I wasn't there anymore. Oof. And he got married and so Anyway, so I said, I'm taking a partner, but I'm afraid I'm losing my brother, and that's what exactly happened. Uh -huh. That's why I'm here, because uh, we didn't get along, you know. I run business legit. This guy wanted to do it a different way. I don't like it, so I says here, and we moved to Colorado. So I lived in Colorado for 35 years. Oh, in Denver or Denver? Yeah. So you have a car dealership there? Or? No, not dealership. I, uh, I, I first I went there to. I was working as a foreman in the Volkswagen agency for a year. <laughs> Meanwhile, I was looking where, what location, and Denver at that time, the repair shops, the pri pri small repair shops were like hole in the wall. So I uh, I bought a, a property and I built a shop and I had a few mechanics working for me. Plus I was mechanic and thank God. <laughs> worked out good. Yeah. I still own the property. Oh. That's how Is I it still a, it's a, a, a repair, yeah. oh, yes. repair shop? Oh yes, as a matter of yeah. fact. And the fellow, he's there for 25 years, he just signed a contract for another 10 years with me. Oh, okay. He's making good money. Good location. Yeah, huh? Very, location, location. Right. Fantastic. Yeah. So when did you meet your wife in uh, all in these 1958, travels? In 1958, uh, sometimes summertime. <laughs> and uh, my friend's uh, aunt was in the summer in the mountains of the Jewish Alps, and uh, she met her mother, and she says, would you like to meet a young fellow? So she said, well, I have fun any time. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what happened? So what happened, uh, I had a blind date, but the trouble is, you know, when you have a gas station, you don't have to, I work six days a week, and sometimes more, you know. Yeah, and Sunday I want to clean, the, clean, the clean up, you know, yeah. clean up the place. And uh, we... I met her and we went a couple times, and I didn't have the time to, you know, to socialize and so much. And then so, I, so I suggested, how about? So we married on her birthday. And, and, her birthday and where went. were where were you born? And were you Brooklyn. born in the Brooklyn? Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Yes. Okay, so you very nice Jewish been. area. Uh, they had. Synagogues on the corner. We could see the couples getting married, and it was really nice. Mm -hmm. But we we dated for like six months, and we got engaged. And six weeks later, we got married because he had nobody, mm -hmm. and he worked his head off. He come to pick me up for a date, and he'd fall asleep on the couch. <laughs> and my mother said, "Well, let's put him to bed and forget the date." And we did that a lot of time. He was exhausted, so then we finally cut him down to shorter hours that we could have a life. Yeah. And uh, so we're married 56 years. What wow. impressed me very much in this country, you know, in Poland, there was a church over there, and then there was a big swimming pool in my town built, the Olympic pool. And we used to go there quite often. And a shortcut was to go through the church the Catholic Church wouldn't allow the Jewish kids to go through, no. you know. It was such a thing. And what happened, I came to this country, especially when I had the gas station, I had priests coming to me. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I couldn't believe it, you know. I never forget the Reverend Hempel. I still remember the name. 50. He, he came to me every time. 
he left me the car, whatever necessary to, and everything, you know. And uh, really, it, that impressed me so much, you know, with this country and everything. Mm -hmm. he but went, they were rare. The he nice went. Ones. He went to. Mm -hmm. He went to Alaska, and uh, well, I opened the '56, maybe '58, maybe '58 or '60. He went to Alaska. He says, "You take the car apart, fix it. I don't want to have any trouble." with the car, he put, even put new tires and everything. He went, he came back, I think after three or four months, he came back, so how was it? Well, I had to replace a few windshields, he had to replace, you know, because that the roads were at that time, the rocks, oh, it was not yeah. paved. <laughs> and the, the, when they, the, he followed road. truck or so, they picked the rocks and boom, he had a few, few windshields had to replace. Yeah. 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 So did back in Poland, did you go to Hebrew school and uh, oh, yes. get your bar mitzvah? Oh, yes. no? I, I went to. I had bar mitzvah. My father wasn't there, you know, because it was in four, 1940. I had my bar mitzvah, but uh, I went to the Hebrew school and I learned. I am not so good at reading, and, uh, no, but. Uh, when my father built the factory, one of my brothers came out the bar mitzvah, so he invited the whole Jewish congregation to the factory. The employees laid out tables, and the, the rabbi saw it. So because the synagogue wasn't far away, the synagogue was like from this building to the next building where you you have another building here by the airport. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe hundred yards. That's all. So the whole thing from the service, and uh, my grandmother cooked, and they made had a meal there and everything. And the rabbi said blessing and everything else. And it was very nice. So they came were there Germans the there at that time? No, no. This is before the Germans. That was uh, thirty-five, nineteen thirty-five. Oh, thir okay. Yeah. Right. But he has a reputation as a very honest mechanic. To this day, they wow. came from all over, yeah. and second generation also. We watched these kids grow up, and then their parents said, you take your car to Leo, he will just put in what you need, and he'll, if he can fix it, he'll do it. And yeah. to this day. Well, I want to sleep at night. That's what I look for, and I, I think everybody I else. Want to, <laughs> I want to sleep at night, not to have a conscience that's, uh, you know, I had a couple families from Connecticut they used to come. They used to live in New York before, but they moved to Connecticut, the company moved them, and he used to take a special day off and come to, to, for, for service with the car. Mm -hmm. If yeah. he could fix it, he didn't give you a new port, he fixed it. Yeah, well, that's... You know, and he put it, uh, finally got him down to five hour, sorry, five day week, oh. and the kids said, oh good, we can see our father. Yeah. I mean, you know, it wrecked a lot of marriages. You're working seven days a week. Yeah. Well, after the gas station, you know, uh, when I took my brother, so that was in the, in 66, after 10 years, the gas station, I look around and I got a shop, you know, with six men working for me. And uh, in Maniola, you know New York? No, I don't no. know. No. Maniola, Long Island. I had a pretty big shop over there, and people follow. I had a following, and, uh, and I went to work. What, in the she, office. what she's talking, <laughs> oh, talking, yeah, what she's talking about, <laughs> what she's talking about fixing, like alternator. You know what's the alternator the generator yes. right, started. Sure. I didn't get the rebuild started. Put it in. I took it apart. I put new brushes. I cleaned it up. I put it back. I charged them my fair price but it was less money than I would get rebuilt. And this, they were the car carburetors, you know, the old time yeah. cars. And car mm -hmm. I, used to, <laughs> I used to take it apart, boil them, clean them, put them together. Yeah. And I used to do those things, everything. Right, yeah. Well, that's that's a successful business. Yeah. Right? People don't like to be overcharged. No, people, and people, People don't mind to pay as long as they know that it's legitimate. Yeah. I have here a good man. You looking for a good man? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honest guy, good. 
It, he's not cheap because not Which the one is he? Huh? Which one? What's uh, his name? Uh, he's on the uh, of Cook. Uh, Cam Cam Stone. Cam Stone. That's the one I go to. <laughs> That's a guy. His uh, name is Guy. He runs the business like I did, and he knows me. Right. He knows me. Guy uh, Cam Stone. That's a mentor. That's where I go. Yes. <laughs> so are you going to the good place? I sent anybody, the, the, when they notice, they ask me. I sent quite a few people there. Yeah. So uh, you, know, you know, you know, you uh, know, Vince, Vincent uh, Anderson? Anderson. You know Vincent Anderson. He was a he's a speaker here about the. Uh, the, the he was in the navy. The, the uh, he I, wrote the book for Leo. Oh, he, he created okay. it. Right. He's unbelievable. I Anyone that. who wants a book like that, he does the whole thing oh, and that, doesn't charge any. Is this the picture book? Yes. Right. I mean, yeah. it took him forever because he kept adding to and it. And he didn't charge nothing. Either. No. Great. And he said, you can recommend anybody to me. I love doing it. Oh, I said, the only thing, don't hound me, I have to do it I at my pace. I sent Vincent over there even to come. He swears by him. Yeah. Okay. I, uh, yeah, Vince is tall. I don't, I don't have as many memorabilia as you do. It's going to be much thinner book. Well, that Vince <laughs> kept adding. I mean, we were amazed. He kept... I said to Leo finally, I, I can't show the book to anyone because he's taken it back to add more stuff. <laughs> and so I got hold of Vince through his wife and I said, she says, I know what you're going to tell me. He's adding again. <laughs> I said, yeah, do something. So she did. I got the book back and I never asked her what she did. I said, thank you. I said, well, we have stuff we want to put in and some of it is fragile, so we don't want to keep it just in the house. So finally... Uh, he said, oh, okay, I have another project. I said, thank you, Lord. <laughs> okay. he, but, he's, uh, but it is a masterpiece. I, I haven't good. seen he's, it all, but it, I, I mean, I it. couldn't believe where he went for research. Okay. Uh -huh. And when my son came out, he got him involved in it. So uh -huh. my son is doing it back in Colorado. And, and the two of them were engrossed. And I said to my son, that book is not leaving this house until we die. That's it. I said, you... Vince put enough into it. I mean, yeah, he wouldn't take a penny for it. That's wonderful to have a, a keepsake like that. That's well, really okay. I don't know if he ever trained for it or he did no, it all he, on his own. He, he's on his own. He's got the software for it. It's yeah. a beautiful gift. Yes, it is. And he's a very, very fine person, although now he's alone. Well. His wife passed on. So his son stays with him, I believe. I well, uh, I tell us a little else. bit. You mentioned the son. Tell us you, you have children. And oh, what? yes. Well. We have three single children, wonderful kids, uh, two daughters and a son and a grandson. Uh, the Holy Terror. Are they spread out over the world? No, or? one son and daughter live together in Aurora, Colorado. They and share what, a house. What's their names? <laughs> Just well, for my the son record. is Perry. Perry Michael Miller and uh, I'm trying to remember what Felice Lynn Miller. That's the two that share a house with the, their dogs. <coughs> so uh, they're considered family so we have to announce they also have <laughs> each have a dog. Uh -huh. And uh, my other daughter lives now she moved Pompano Beach. Right. Edith Florida. Joyce Mittler. In Florida? She, in Florida, uh -huh. yeah. She just got a nice new job. And she has a son, Jordan Mittler. I forgot the middle name. Jordan, what the heck is his middle name? Jordan Mittler, okay, that's okay. enough. Okay, Jordan Mittler. No dog. You're on but, the camera. Uh, oh, I forgot. I'm sorry, camera. You get to loosen up. I've never been on camera before that right. I remember anyway. But, uh, <laughs> No, but they're, so, they're wonderful uh, kids, but no, nobody got married, so... Okay. How, how old's the grandson? He will be... In, in May, May, he's going to be They're one day years. apart. Oh. Leo and my grandson, one day apart. Uh-huh. But Jordan decides... Except the years are not the same, a day apart. <laughs> no, but Jordan starts two months before to nudge, uh, to remember it's his birthday. And I said, Jordan, how could we forget your birthday? 
He says, it's possible. I said, no, don't worry about it. I'll take Grandma if you say so. Um, so he's he's a lot of fun when he comes for a visit. He's not still. Ah, uh, and, so, and how old is he now? He's nine and three quarters. Okay. There, Leo will be 88, and he will be 10. Okay. Right. And yeah. uh, he's a very Is there anything gifted. else would you like to know from me? Or the reason I'm making because I have a gardener and uh, I wanted to get him. He's supposed to, he's working in my house. Oh no, outside your house, <laughs> not in your house. That's a little scary. But I think the one thing that you should do is lift your shirt, yeah. just the arm, and display your numbers. That's the purpose of the whole thing, oh, I thought. Right. Let it be seen that it's... I don't it's, know. If, yeah, no, it's yeah. right here. Can you I see? think you'll have to stand up and uh, I think hold it. Okay, that, that's it. Here. You see the number 3523? Three. Well, that's, it's another story. Then. Uh, they tattoo me in construction. Okay. Okay. okay, but they beat me. Here is another one. Oh. Can you see it? Three five two three zero. Huh? Right. Huh. Okay, there is a story to it. that one. So you, you have two. Then. A same number. Oh, okay. When I was in that, moved to the lumber yard factory, it was summertime. And one German, he says, What is your number? Because he didn't spot it, because it's faded. So I showed him, he says, no, you did something. He called a supervisor, the capo, and they beat me up. Hmm. And they beat me up and then they put this number on it. Hmm. That's the same number, except the uh, artistic way they put it on. To, ma to make it, you know, to make it easy. Yeah, right. But uh, I mean, when we when he agreed to go, he, he they said the purpose was because he was a survivor. We still meet people who said it never took place. Uh, yeah, that's amazing. I just uh, yes, but <laughs> I can't. I work with one. They're gonna honor me this coming month at the tolerance a, center. A, a, in that tolerance center. I don't know you know tolerance. The one center. in uh, Rancho uh, Rancho Mirage. Yes. Rancho yeah. Mirage. Yes. Mirage. Yes. Yeah. As a Holocaust, a man of the year, yeah. Holocaust survivor. Right. I'm supposed to go to San Bernardino? No, or Sacramento. Uh, no. Sacramento, but I can't, uh, I can't take the trip. Hmm. What He's happened, we, got, we wind up in the hospital, both of them, on pneumonia, hmm. you know, a couple, yeah, of, weeks, a couple of weeks ago. And oh, I really? Yeah. From the, the two of us, but a few days apart, yeah. And they weren't quite sure with the diagnosis. They think the uh, flu shot that we got caused some kind of quirk, and a lot of people got pneumonia from it. Wow. Well, I got hmm. sick on account the way they gave her a treatment. I took her in with emergency, 8 o'clock in the evening. She lay there till 3.30 in the morning on an ER. Yeah. And I'm making stink about it because my immune system went so much down that I contracted. And a few you days think later, you caught something there, right? Yeah. A few days well, later, they, they, they're know. not sure really what diagnosis. So they didn't know what medication to give us, and then they sent us to rehab, hmm. and they don't order the medicine until you set foot on their premises. Yeah, I mean it's horrible. What usually, time is it? Usually nine o'clock, I'm in bed. And I was nine o'clock to two, three thirty in the morning up. I couldn't function. I couldn't do nothing. The next yeah, day I yeah. was. The I, I did, she was. She was in the hospital. I called and I says I can't come. There's something wrong. I can't. And then when they discharged her, I took her home. The next day I went to the hospital. Mm. And I spotted his symptoms. And yeah. he's walking around in a pair of winter pajamas hmm. and a, a robe and a blanket. And I said, something's not right. Yeah. I said, could I take your temperature? And he says, okay. So okay. take the temperature, 103. I mm -hmm. said, I'm calling for help. Yeah. And he said, okay. And I got so. to sit in the front seat of the 
ambulance? Yep. Oh, well, well yeah. yeah. And they I took guess. me to Ike because I don't drive anymore. And uh, So you went to Eisenhower? Yes. Yeah. And then I had a beggar ride. For Eisenhower the to hospital home. was fine since when we got into the hospital. But this ER, uh, it's not on the Eisenhower ER. Every ER in this country is stinks. And that is something should be done about it yeah. for other people. They come there and they treat it like a piece of dirt. They don't have know? enough staff. Yeah. Especially yeah. especially yeah. us on the left leg. I get there over there. Where is the compassion? They they taught these people to have some compassion, the doctor's compassion. They're nothing. There's like a number. There's yeah. like a number. There's number, yeah. That's right. Oh. And when and they had a bed, they didn't have a nurse, so they couldn't take me to the room. Yeah. So he went home Sounds 4 o'clock familiar. in the morning, and I was a nervous wreck till that's I heard that he That's a lot of baloney, they didn't have the nurse. Yeah. Well, that's they what have they the said. nurse, they what make excuses. Is it? I forgot my watch. It's, it's uh, 22 well, to 3. I know you want to go, but I think you've uh, been involved in a number of activities, uh, mainly in the Sun City uh, desert area here. Of, well, with the uh, veterans well, I, am, and I was involved with the veterans uh, in the Sun City, in Del Webb over there. The, the fellow who was here testifying just before me, we went to 29 Palms, we barbecue for them. Mm -hmm. And I was with them, uh, with John Mannion, and so we spent the whole day over the barbecue for the soldiers who were coming from Iraq back. That was quite a few years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, this book what I have, the news and views. Uh, oh. You could read uh, you read the story about it. And, uh, that is, uh, they honor me as a veteran of the month or year. I don't know. It's it probably the year in, uh, right. in Sun City. Right. And right. now you're yeah. now you're going to be honored again. I am the, on the front page of it. Yeah. Well, congratulations as well. Yeah, it'll be at, what, you. April 24th, I think. It'll be a luncheon at the Rancho Mirage and uh, maybe a few unexpected guests. I can't say at this moment, but uh, it should be nice. We'll, uh, and, uh, we'll look for you on the evening news. I doubt it, but uh, the, the, the people that work there are wonderful. I mean, since we've been around since I, they put I it would, up. I would like to go on the news and ex expose the situation we ER, that they shouldn't happen to other people, yeah. that people should wake up. The, the congressman uh, Ruiz, yeah. you know, I know him personally, and I him? called his office. I wanted to talk to him. He didn't want to talk to me because he knows what I'm going to talk about, what happened. He used oh, to yeah, work yeah. over there. Yeah. He should get other congressmen and everything. They should look into it, that it shouldn't happen. It's all over the country, that thing with the old people. Mm -hmm. Not only all the young people who go up for emergency, they should be taken care of, not just put them in the corner and sit there and wait. Yeah. Someone Terrible. told us that it's not only this hospital, which amazed yeah. me in a way, that, that it's all. Cool. There is no control, no management in the ER, you know? The executives sitting there and making money, and they don't care what's going on as long as they protect it, they have a shield. I tried to talk on the radio, they don't want to touch it. They don't want to touch it. Mm. Well. Well, it's yeah, wrong. Have any influence, it's so. it's wrong, you know. Yeah. The thing to do is not to go through ER, but I, I think probably we don't have a choice. That you have to go through ER. But well, it seems like these things always get worse in the night. <laughs> well, that's no, only a choice. There's been, there's been for years like this because I've been already an emergency that three, four times, and she was like a few times, and every time. It's bad. You wait an hour, two hours, three hours, but eight and a half hours. Yeah, it's. Uh, but I still meet people I, with I, stories like I that. I never complained the two, three hours what I was waiting, and I was dying, bleeding through my rectum and everything else, yeah. and this fine, but here, eight and a half hours, and that's why I got sick. 
That's why right. I got yeah. sick. Before you, you go get, get sick again. Get run down, <laughs> get exposed to things. Well, you're, yeah, and yeah. you're exposed to everything that's in the yeah. ER. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then they so. walked in at one time, a whole batch of cops. And I figured now who, they, I never found out what they were, but they, you know what? They had the prison. They had the no, prison. They were on. Oh. Thank yeah, you. you were saying, I didn't know what it was. Yeah. Well, I you, froze. you didn't know what was going on. You were well, no, that, I was walking around at that point. Okay. That was, I don't want to make it short. This, are we finished? Well, I'll let, I'm willing to listen uh, okay. as long as you are willing well, to talk. This, this has nothing to do with the. With with the, the I, I don't know what type of God you were supposed to come If anyway. you could publicize what we were talking now, it would be wonderful. But, uh, it doesn't. Uh, I, um, can, I don't have that power, no, I, I guess. Know. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Yeah. But, How do you keep those shoes so sparkly and white? I keep them in a box. He just, he just I, I keep mine in a box. <laughs> <laughs> just just no, I, I, I just bought them actually. Oh, that's, the that's why it's so beautiful. He bought them on the count we were coming. Oh, you yeah. yeah. Brand that's new, right. Brand new you got to look good. <laughs> well, you do. Everything looks so well, spotless. Anyway. Okay. Thank you very well, much. I want to well. thank you for your service to your fellow mankind here uh, and to your country. Yeah, I want to try and keep you around another few we'll years. All we have is each this. other. If tomorrow all the things were gone, I'd work for all my life. And I had to start again With just my children and my wife I thank my lucky stars To be living here today Cause the flag still stands for freedom And they can't take that away And I'm proud to be an American The men who died, who gave that right to me And I gladly stand up next to you and defend her still today Cause there ain't no doubt I love this land God bless the USA From the lakes of Minnesota To the hills of Tennessee Across the plains of Texas From sea to shining sea From Detroit down to Houston And New York to L.A. Where there's pride in every American heart And it's time we stand and say Cause there ain't no doubt I